Hello, and welcome back to The Hatch. I'm Sammy Roth. And I'm Rosie Murphy, and this is the podcast where we talk about Lost. We are watching Season 3, Episode 17, Catch-22. Uh, very exciting. It's a Desmond episode. All Desmond episodes are very exciting, in my opinion. Famously, this is the one where he uh, becomes a monk and then gets fired and then meets Penny. That is very famous. Uh, we also have the final part of our conversation with Ivan Asquith, a TV producer who has written about Lost, uh, wrapping up the conversation about the Lost experience. Let's get to the episode. So before we get into our hot takes uh, about Catch-22, we have a listener hot take from Wendy in Ohio. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Rosie. This is Wendy. I'm here in Ohio, and I have been listening to your show the entire time. I'm calling in today because I just finished listening to Left Behind, the most recent episode. And in the interview with Ivan, he talked about how JJ is all about the mystery box. And right near the end, um, you guys started talking about how, you know, any answers uh, weren't going to be satisfying enough for things like the smoke monster, the whispers, uh, Locke's miracle uh, that happened with his legs. And that's because you guys love the mystery box, clearly, even though Sammy kind of indicated that he doesn't love that concept. Um, you guys pretty much proved that you do love it. Um, at the end of the podcast there. So I guess, you know, everyone who gets upset about the polar bears um, and not having an answer for that, maybe that was a mystery box. All right. Thanks so much for the podcast again. It's awesome. So I think, uh, I think Wendy is, is right. We, um, I think we're, we're both fans of the mystery box concept and, uh, you know, we're with JJ on that, and we, we kind of seem to agree with him that opening the box is, is not the best part of the box. Right, right. Contemplating the box yes. is the best part. <laughs> we're intellectuals so, here on the hatch. We contemplate. <laughs> well, and I think that's what we were getting at uh, in the conversation with Ivan in terms of the contemplation was so good that, of course, the, the answers, such as they were, were going to feel disappointing just because they were never going to be as fun as the questions absolutely because the questions were so good not necessarily because the answers were were substandard just <laughs> the questions were so good i absolutely agree yeah so let's um let's do our own hot takes oh boy um why is everyone on this island good at ping pong is ping pong just a thing that people are good at like do people know how to i if you put me in front of a ping pong table i would be I would never make contact with the ball. Is that just a thing that people... Because apparently, like, Sawyer and Jack and multiple other... Enough people on this island are, like, good at ping pong that there's a whole scene where they all... And I guess there's, like, nothing else to do, so maybe they're practicing a lot. But huh. Jack just shows up, you know, invited by Sawyer to play ping pong, and they're, like, diving for shots and seemingly doing very well at it. And yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Anyway, Sammy, what is your hot take? Um, okay, I'm going to try to sneak two in. Um, one, I just think it's absolutely hilarious that they convinced Jin that they are going to go camping when literally everything they've been doing every day since they've got to this island is camping. <laughs> <laughs> and now they're just going to go further down the beach and roast marshmallows and they're going to be excited because it's camping. So that was fun. Yeah, they're just making it special. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a great plot device. Um, and Jin telling the yeah. story is awesome. Um, second hot take. I very much agreed with Desmond's interpretation of the Abraham being asked to kill his son story in the mm. Bible, where he says, uh, where he says to Brother Campbell, um, you know, one might argue that God need not have asked Abraham to sacrifice his son in the first place. And I thought, yeah, you know, that has always been my problem with that story. It's one of the, the big, you know, classic biblical stories that I just don't like. And that's exactly why. So thank you, Desmond, for articulating that for me. <laughs> he's, yes. not, he's not a good thank... monk. No, no. <laughs> but no, I agree. I think that's, a, again, I don't want to make assumptions about what's common or uncommon. But I think there are a lot of people who would agree with you on that and just say, like, I don't get the Abraham Isaac thing. Yeah. I don't get it. Yeah. I'm one of them. Good. Well, thank you, Desmond. 
All right, hot takes out of the way. This is a meaty episode. Ooh, lots of, lots to talk about. Uh, where to begin? I mean, we, we could start with the love triangle stuff, or we could save that for the end. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. No, um, I, I, you know, the, the thing that I love most about this episode, besides the fact that the story of Desmond and Penny and how they met is truly wonderful, um, I just kind of love the mind-bending mechanics of the making sure the future comes to pass stuff. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I, I love that. I love that Desmond now just seems to have this sort of preternatural understanding of how this works. That, like, okay, I've seen these flashes. I've seen how they end. Like, mm-hmm. I've got to put the pieces together and make sure that the things leading up to that end happen, or it will change. Like, it's just he. He just ever since the electromagnetism, you know, like did its thing on him. He just kind of seems to get this sort of thing that I think a normal right. person would not, you know, like inherently understand that. Right. And and I just find myself, you know, like really wondering the whole time, knowing how this episode ends, is there any chance that if he had let Charlie die, that it would have been Penny and not Widmore's team? Whoa. And I you hadn't know, considered that. I I you know, it's probably crazy, but Maybe it isn't. Ooh. I mean, the the big question that I came away with was, was Desmond going to let Charlie die? Right. And Or was he, you know, committed to sort of following the vision as long as he could, but he was never going to quite go that far? I mean, I know he says at the end, I keep saving your life. And what good has it done? It's just going to keep happening again and again. Maybe that's the point, yeah. Maybe it's a test. Test. My God, testing Abraham. Except that field. Because I changed what I saw. I mean, it, it feels like he was considering not intervening in this one. I agree with you. I, I think that the way I, I interpreted it, at least, that it, it seemed like he hadn't made a decision until he had to. Yeah. Like, he was waiting and waiting and, and probably kind of hoping that it wouldn't come to that somehow. Right. Um, but yeah, I mean, he waits until the very last possible second, and, and it kind of looks like a game-time decision. Right. Right. Um, and I get that he doesn't know exactly when it's going to happen, and Charlie does still step on the trap thing, and... I don't think Desmond like made him step on the trap. So of course it was always going to be a little bit sudden, but yeah, I, I don't know. I could go, I could really go either way. I mean, I, I think that, I think that the, you know, what I was feeling as I watched this is this is Desmond's worst moment on the show. Like it's very mm-hmm. difficult to watch the scenes with Charlie where Charlie is like, you know, yelling at him, like, I don't want to go into the jungle. This is dangerous. Rousseau's traps are there. And Desmond, you know, mm-hmm. knows very well that that's what's going to happen and insists yep. to Charlie, not only insists to Charlie that they do it, but insists, like, Charlie, I saved your life. Don't you trust me? You've got to trust me. When in reality, he knows he's, you know, potentially leading Charlie to leading his death. to his death, yeah. Um, it doesn't, you know, I know that Desmond wants Penny to be there, but it's uh, definitely not a not a good look on a character who who usually has a pretty good look. Right, and we don't really have any evidence at all that this is going to be Penny. You know, one thing that I I don't didn't remember seeing in this episode was when when he has the flash at the beginning. Um, I paused and like you know rewatched it like four different times because it goes by so quickly. And at the very end of it, there actually is a very quick flash of Penny's face. Um, Not just in the photograph, but, like, that's how it ends. Like, a full-screen flash of just Penny's face for, like, a split second that you have to pause at the right moment to see. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe that's where he was getting it. Yeah, that makes sense. But I guess, again, then that, I'm talking in circles a bit here, but... That makes me wonder, again, like, what what these flashes, was that, you know, a prophecy? Like you said, like, if Desmond had done anything, done everything according to plan, would it have happened that way? Or is that, like, is Desmond inserting his own desires or his own subconscious, you know, 
maybe it's possible that his subconscious is somehow controlling what he's seeing or he wants it to be Penny so badly that he yeah. sees Penny or, no, I, or something. I, I think from like a just objective standpoint, like you're right that, that that's probably, you know, mm-hmm. the simple, you know, that's the Occam's razor here that Desmond sees what he wants to see and interprets it how he wants to interpret it. Um, I just kind of love to, to hold on to the possibility that maybe this is like a Schrodinger's cat situation where, you know, you right. don't know what's in the box until, um, you know, once what, you know, that I, there could still be multiple possibilities in the box until you open the box. Um, right. just cause that, that feels very losty and even though I don't know that it's really that strongly suggested by the evidence here. Ooh, man, I'm going to be thinking about that one. Well, I mean, this, this is my hindsight and I'm going to blow it now, but like, we know in hindsight that both Penny and her father are searching for the island in boats, right. um, which I love, which I just think is a wonderful parallel. And it's like, you know, watching this episode, it's okay. Which one is it going to be? Is it going to be, you know, Widmore the father or Widmore the daughter? And it turns out to be Widmore the, the father, unfortunately. Right. Right. Huh. Yeah. Ooh, man, I'm, <laughs> I'm down the rabbit hole in my head now. Um, <laughs> oh, do, do it out loud. Do do the in your head parts out loud. <laughs> oh, gosh. So Penny and Charles are simultaneously searching for the island, as we know. Um, yes. Desmond sees in the near future this series of events that lead to a vision of Penny herself on the island. So yeah, maybe maybe you're right in terms of there are kind of multiple timelines here and whatever Desmond chooses will lead to will land them on one of those timelines and they they are all possible because of these events that are already in motion which is Penny and Charles searching and coming fairly close. Huh? Exactly. Okay. Fascinating, fascinating so take. In, instead of Penny's boat, we're going to get not Penny's boat. Yes, we are. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> this this is the oh, first boy. episode I realized watching it that gestures back in any way to the final scene of season two, where you have Penny's listening station and them locating the island. Like, you know, it's been 17 episodes and we've just been waiting. Like, what was that scene doing there? And now it's Holy like, oh, crap, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's what that scene's doing there. OK, well, then that makes from like the, my perspective as a viewer, that makes way more sense now that we might come to the conclusion that oh, Penny's found the island because of, that happened. And I had just forgotten about it because, like you said, it's been 17 episodes and so much other stuff has happened. Yeah. Oh, my. Yeah. Very satisfying. They distracted us with those cages so we'd forget the good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, oh, what um, should we talk about, like, the flashbacks? Because there's a lot going on in the... I'm sure you have opinions on Desmond being fired as a monk, for instance. Oh, incredible plot line. Just yeah. incredible. Um, before I get to the point I want to make, I just want to give a shout-out to the scene where Desmond and Penny meet and are exchanging the boxes and are having that wonderful, pleasant little conversation. And Michael Cicchino just comes through with this huge and epic and moving score... And I mean, of course, if an ex-monk already has plans, then... You know, I don't usually get in the cars with strangers. Well, in that case, I'm Penelope. Penny. Desmond. Very nice to meet you, Penny. Oh, it's so hard to not get emotional. And I was like, oh my goodness, the music, the music on the show is too much it sometimes. Is. Uh, that's, that's two anyway. weeks in a row you've got a uh, Giacchino playing over over uh, the scene hot take. I know, but it, it's so good. He's so good. He um, is. And Can it, I- you know, it, it just sort of paints all of the Desmond and Penny in this like beautiful halcyon, like, oh, re- you know, remember that this is a great love story framing and it's beautiful. Anyway, um, so... When Desmond goes to see the woman who we now know is his ex fiance, um, Ruth, when she says, We dated for six years, and the closest you ever came to a religious experience was Celtic winning the cup, which is just like an 
extremely good burn. Um, <laughs> hey, I identified oh. with that. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's okay. That, that'll be me when the Dodgers win the World Series. That'll be my religious experience. A religious ex- The thing that might make you want to become a monk. Um, <laughs> but, I, yeah, I mean, when she says... Next time you want to break up with someone, Des, don't join a monastery. Just tell the girl you're too bloody scared. Now I'm starting to get a little more the Desmond is a coward line. Like, I know we've we've discussed in the past, um, and even with, with Henry and Cusick we talked about this, right? About how the Desmond is a coward argument has always... Um, yeah, Ian, Ian didn't little... buy into that. Yeah. And I think this is the clearest evidence we've had for it yet. I still don't necessarily buy into it, but here we have someone sort of really saying plainly Desmond is a coward. Um, and I, I don't, I'm the closest I've been to agreeing. I, I, Although am I don't with know you that I that. totally do. Yeah. I, I am with you though, because I mean, it's his whole thing about how, you know, I, I, I couldn't be with you because I, you know, I, I got drunk and I woke up and he was he was standing there over me and I knew I was supposed to go with him and leave everything behind and I have a greater calling. It it's really lame, actually, and it <laughs> I mean it it's like really you know you yeah. you couldn't acknowledge that you wanted to break up with her. You had to because I, I think he believes it himself. So it's like not only right. you're lying right. to her, you're you know you you can't even yourself. yourself face the truth and you're telling yourself it's because you have this greater calling. It's like. Well, yeah, he has a he has a greater calling, and and we'll talk about that and everything. Brother Campbell tells him and Penny in the island, right. but like it's definitely not to go be a monk. Like that's his excuse for for breaking up with her. Yeah. Um, no, I'm I'm with you, and I, I feel like the last time we had this conversation too, we also like circled around the is Desmond a coward idea for a while, and mm-hmm. you know couldn't really reach a firm conclusion. And I don't know, I, I I think that Ian is, you know, is right that the character is noble enough and brave enough at times that it's hard to just classify him as, you know, coward. But he he certainly has trouble he certainly has trouble owning up to stuff sometimes. Like Yeah. I think I think you're right on with the fact that he's also lying to himself in a lot of these instances. Like he he wants in in maybe in the same way that he wants Penny to be coming to the island he he wants to have a greater calling he wants his life to be more meaningful than what it what it seems to be at this at the point at which this flashback takes place um he you know and and arguably penny gives him that calling at least for a while and i wonder if if you could argue that he kind of spins up this narrative where okay, well, Penny, you know, this relationship with Penny is my great, my great calling, my one true whatever. Um, And therefore, maybe that's part of why he has to prove himself to Charles Woodmore so much. Like, if he, if he's going to be worthy of this calling, Hmm. he needs to do it perfectly. I, I don't know. Is there anything there? I think there is. Um, I mean, I think that his his calling is, is twofold and kind of depends on how you look at it because he's got the calling right. of, you know, the great love story with Penny, but he's also got the calling of the work he's supposed to do on the island, um, right. which is both pushing the button and later doing the thing with the corkscrew in the underground area. Right, right. right. Um, I, I, actually, what you're saying kind of like gives me a little bit of a crazy theory um, go, go that, I'm gonna, that I'm going to just talk through out loud here. <laughs> Well, we so okay. Here we go. So you know, we we know from the previous flashback that you know Miss Hawking, you know, was there to kind of mm-hmm. step in at a certain point of his life and and redirect him to make sure that mm-hmm. he he didn't stay with Penny, that he does go to the island, that he does push the button. She was, you know, mm-hmm. that that you know there to course correct. Um, much the same way Brother Campbell does that in this episode, and it's hmm. and and you know I don't know if if you recall this, but there's a picture of Brother Campbell and Miss Hawking on his desk. Um, that they zoom in on, you know, like really intently for a moment when Desmond is leaving the monastery. So it's like, what is the connection between Brother Campbell and Miss Hawking? We don't know. Yeah. But, you know, clearly he's, you know, he's kind of a similar force. And, and we get that when he, you know, mm-hmm. says to Desmond, you know, I have little doubt that God has different plans for you than being a monk. 
you've spent too much time running away to realize what you may be running toward. Like that, that could be a line that's right out of Miss Campbell, Miss Hawking's mouth. Yeah. Um, and, and I think at the end, it's also pretty intentional that he, you know, wants Desmond to go load those boxes. He wants him to meet Penny. Like, you know, again, who knows where, where he's getting his information or his source of wisdom here, but like he is a course correcting agent in the same way. So my, my crazy theory is, um, is what if Desmond's whole life has just been like kind of pseudo determined by a series of these like moments of these, you know, agents of the universe prodding Desmond toward where they, you know, see him as needing to go, um, you know, on this path toward, you know, that could involve leaving Ruth and meeting Penny and going to the island right. and doing stuff on the island and then eventually getting rescued by Penny, like if this is the course that Desmond's life is supposed to take, you know, I don't want to discount free will or like give him Mm -hmm. a pass. Um, But maybe some element of what's seen as, you know, Desmond running away and cowardice Mm -hmm. is really the fact that there are these more powerful forces at work prodding him always to take these steps and go in the direction that he's supposed to go. Hmm. Okay. That's, that's my, that's my crazy theory. I don't think it's that crazy because in the in the same way that all of Ben Linus's plots play on flaws that people already have and play on character traits that people already have, it makes a lot of sense that Ms. Hawking and, you know, whoever is sort of her minions are in Scotland um, would also sort of play on Desmond's inherent traits. Um, so they would know he's the sort of person who might get too drunk and pass out and look up at the sky and see a monk. And that would, Mm. you know, you know, they, they know he doesn't really want to marry this woman. He wants to get out of this relationship. And so they're able to act upon those impulses and, and, you know, motivate him based on motivations he already has. Yeah. I like that. that I like the comparison to Ben. Yeah, I know it's, it's manipulative is what it is. It's, you know, the universe is manipulating Desmond into doing things that are not always pleasant for him. Well, and, and that, that is such a nice parallel with this episode because here Desmond is manipulating the, our friends in order to do what the universe wills, you know, or what he, what he sees in the future, which is in theory, sort of the, you know, what is going, what is fated to happen. Um, God, yeah. And instead of trying to thwart fate, which is what he's been doing with, with Charlie until now, um, he's trying to fulfill fate. Uh, Whoa. Fate. <laughs> My God. And so, yeah, so he is exercising free will. It's not like he's a, you know, it's not like we're in a dollhouse, but he is able to, you know, he has been sort of transported into this plane where he is able to like dialogue with fate, you know, like he can, he can see the immediate future and basically decide whether or not he wants it. Um, and I mean, it's, it's more complex than that, but that's fundamentally what's happening. And well, that's interesting. I mean, I like that because it, it, I like the idea that now, you know, now it's not just fate, you know, like, manipulating Desmond behind the scenes like now it's it's kind of like leveling with him and he has more of a say in the matter like, right that's kind of cool right Oof. getting kind of tingly this got deep <laughs> it's I feel like it's been a little while since we got this deep oh boy yeah um, I mean Desmond I don't want to I don't want to excuse his actions either I mean like right you right. know, he, the way he, he treats Ruth in the flashback, you know, it's it's pretty terrible. Clearly sucks. Yeah. Um, and, you know, when, when he when he does, you know, quote unquote, run away from Penny and, and go on the boat race around the world rather than just being with her, which they both want because he needs to impress right. her father, like, that's not good either. Um, but I guess it's just, it seems like there are some extenuating circumstances in Desmond's life. Right. Like is how I would put it. I guess I guess if you know, if there were no Eloise Hawking and there were no whatever, um and Desmond had somehow met Penny, he still might have wanted to run away. It just wouldn't have been the boat race around the world. You know, there there would have been 
something else. He also might not have um, followed that instinct if it hadn't been for the prodding of the universe. Right. 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 But um, he would have but had the instinct. The instinct would have still been there. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I think your your analogy of Ben is very astute. It's, you know, taking advantage of, of you know, what's mm-hmm. already there in someone. Right. Ah, poor Desmond. Wow. I really I mean, think, maybe this is my hindsight, but I, I really think that if there was any kind of, you know, sequel or follow-up to Lost, I would love to see the story of, of Hurley figuring out a way to get Desmond off the island and back to Penny, even if it was just a one-off. That would be so satisfying. Right, right, which I have to believe happens. I refuse to. Oh, absolutely. That it absolutely. I take that on faith, but I want to see it. <laughs> I want to see it, damn it. Yeah. Oh, jeez. We um, we have we have managed to avoid talking about the Jack Kate Sawyer Juliet storyline. Uh, I mean, what is there to say? I mean, <laughs> maybe it's so bad it's good. Like that's the best I can, I can say for it. Like, all I've got is Kate getting upset and then going, you know, expressing that via having sex with Sawyer. Like that felt very like real and relatable. Um, that didn't feel super contrived, actually. Although the rest of it all felt very contrived. Everything that that created that moment felt contrived. Yeah. Like Kate and Jack, you know, in the kitchen, and and you know, like then. Jack going over to have dinner with Juliet being a big... It felt like something out of, you know, like a a bad high school school. drama. Kate licking the spoon. Yeah, who are you having lunch with today? Like, everybody calm down. Ugh. I know. And and the the ping pong scene where, like, they had to, like, (laughs) contrive all of that dialogue to get to a point of Jack telling Sawyer, I had dinner with Juliet last night. Like, it was just, like, so, so mechanical and so obvious. Um, I'm ready for this plot line to be over. When, when when I was saying that maybe it's so bad it's good, I guess I was just thinking of the moment where Sawyer asks Kate for some afternoon delight and then explains that means sex. That means sex. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. <laughs> Sawyer had a lot of good lines this episode, but that unintentionally may be the best one. <laughs> yeah, no, that made me laugh. Anyway. Sawyer, for what it's worth, always just very on brand. Yes. <laughs> always just himself. <laughs> Uh, so we um, we have the last piece this week of an interview with Ivan Asquith. Um, we've had him on the last couple of weeks. Uh, he is a TV producer. He's been called the Fan Whisperer. Um, and we're going to talk about The Lost Experience, which was the alternate reality game uh, between seasons two and three, um, which he has written about and will be sort of picking up on our conversation from, from last week. As Sammy said, this will be the last we hear from Ivan Asquith. Next week, we will be back with uh, the remainder of our interview with Nestor Carbonell, who, of course, plays the wonderful Richard Alpert. You say in the paper that you're trying to, you know, judge the success on on sort of three metrics as a promotional campaign for Lost, you know, whether it adds to the narrative of the show for the dedicated fans, mm-hmm. and then is it successful as a promotional platform for sponsors? Right. Um, and I think on the the sponsor aspect i don't i don't know that i want to go too deep on yeah. that here but basically my takeaway from this is that for a couple of these sponsors not sprite you know that really integrated organically and had a way that you know connected that wasn't you know really blatant and in your face that it was basically successful for them right uh for the sponsors yeah for the sponsors yeah i believe so i mean i don't think anyone felt like it was a poorer use of their money than running banner advertisements that summer Um, but I also don't think that (laughs) in the subsequent experiments that ABC did with kind of making lost an immersive narrative that you could interact with, I don't believe, and I'd have to go back and look, I don't want to misrepresent this, but I don't believe they ever made quite that bold an attempt to integrate a brand again, Interesting. which was some combination of brands not being as interested after that, or them deciding that brands had not been worth kind of the, that the money they made from brand involvement was not worth the ways in which it deteriorated the story or the story's impact on driving viewership of the show. That's interesting because when I, you know, when I was reading about this just as a fan, my, you know, my reaction to it and, and, and to an extent at the time, although I don't remember my full reaction at the time, but I'm thinking, gee, if, if this works successfully as a promotional campaign for the show, mm-hmm. like, doesn't that ultimately have more value or potentially have more value than, you know, whatever, you know, cash money you might get in the door from a, a sponsor that, that could, you know, hurt the promotional value for the fans? Yeah, I mean, you would, you would certainly 
think so. Um, are you are you saying more value to the advert to the brand advertisers or to ABC? Yeah, yeah. Lost? I, I mean, I mean more value to the network, you know, to promote its TV show. I, I guess I just I, I was thinking, gee, I'm sure they could make some, you know, make some money selling these, you know, selling the sponsorship opportunity to the brands for this. But at the end of the day, it just it made me think, like, isn't there isn't there a lot more value here in terms of like building, you know, loyal viewership and more viewership for the show? Isn't that going to be more valuable for the network in the long run? Yeah, I mean, it, it certainly it's a logical way to assess it, and the the honest answer is one of my biggest frustrations at the time was that ABC and the advertisers who sponsored that project had no interest whatsoever in sharing any data with the public about how it performed or how they felt about it. Hmm. So the only real way, you know, in, in my experience so far, that you can try to extrapolate how they felt about how it went is to look at what else they did after that and what parts of it they tried to replicate and what parts they didn't. Um, you know, it's been long enough that actually it would be fascinating to go back and see if anyone involved in it was willing to have a more candid talk now about why they did or didn't feel it was successful. So, what I mean, in terms of the the non, you know, branding aspects, in terms of just as a as a campaign to get people excited about Lost and to add to the narrative of the show, how what, what was your assessment of how it did on those fronts? Um, this is going to sound like an oversimplified answer, and maybe it is, but my my suspicion then and and just as much so now was there's an old saying like well if you like that kind of thing you're going to like that thing um i think for people who wanted an excuse to continue engaging with the show who wanted more things to stoke them and to argue about with other people online all summer it was at the very least good enough if it wasn't you know revelatory and show changing or life changing or anything like that, it was for a lot of people a fun diversion that they could spend some time on. In retrospect, when you look back at it now, or even right after it was over, especially knowing where the show was and wasn't going, I don't know that it had any meaningful narrative contribution to make to the show. Um, You know, the Hanzo Foundation never ended up being especially important in the way that, uh, that that ARG might have implied. And the funny thing, I don't think the Valenzetti equation was ever referenced outside of being on the blast door map either. Exactly right, and so the the funny thing about that is that's probably not an accident. When you you know one of the things I found out when I worked with um, Big Spaceship and when I interviewed them about their work on the Oceanic Airlines website, one of the first things I asked them was, "How much did you know about where the show was going?" Because if you if you were kind of to the point of my essay, if you were generating clues, were they clues shaped with any understanding of what you were giving clues about? And they said, no, for the most part, we came up with all of those ideas ourselves. And they said, great, go ahead and run with it. Because it probably wasn't even, for the most part, approved or looked at by the showrunners. It was probably approved by the marketing department that paid for that work to be done. And I think the same thing was true on some of You know, I know there were show writers, I think Javi most prominently, were involved with Yeah, Javi and Mark's watch. Yeah, he was, was involved in plotting and scripting The Lost Experience and was proud of it to some extent. But it's funny, I had interviewed Javi... Um, I believe before the Lost Experience even launched about some of the other kind of transmedia cross-platform things that the show had been experimenting with. And even he expressed some, some, I wouldn't call it anxiety at the time, but some skepticism and said, you know, all of this stuff is fun and it's interesting, but I'm not sure if I really believe that we're in a place or headed towards a place where anyone wants to have to do homework just to keep up with a TV show. And so the funny, the challenge about ARG is about anything that's kind of, you know, I think this is true of the lost video game, of the lost novels, of Bad Twin, of all of this stuff, is how do you make it meaningful enough that it doesn't feel like a waste of time, but not in any way so meaningful that anyone's missing something if they don't look at it, which is a, a pretty damning challenge to give someone, right? Like, make this feel like the, fun. Those seem like opposite, opposite kind of goals. There. Exactly. Like, make this indispensable, but also completely dispensable. <laughs> Um, and I think, you know, the lost experience was fun while it was happening and then in the end was forgettable. And from a marketing perspective, maybe that's exactly what they hoped it would be. Something that kept you talking about it, but not something that interfered with the agenda of the showrunners. What does the what does the landscape look like for for transmedia, you know, engagement or alternate reality today with T V shows? Is anyone still doing anything like this? Is there a social media era version of this kind of, of thing? I would say so. Um I mean I you know, in the years after the lost experience I actually ended up at Big Spaceship being responsible for designing and running some of these things myself. I think the kind of heyday moment where everyone thought maybe this was the way to do things 
is sort of past and I I wonder sometimes if part of the reason it's past is because we've entered a moment in media and culture and society where there's not a huge appetite for things that are openly fake muddying the public discourse where you know there's already so much skepticism about fake news and about misrepresentation and distortion of facts Right. I had I had deep fakes in my notes here as a point to raise as well. Yeah, when you already aren't sure what's real, it becomes less fun to stumble across a company that's purporting to be real for the purposes of marketing a TV show and then may turn out not to be. Um, I think, if anything, with, while there are still kind of online narrative companion elements to shows and movies that unfold, far more than at the beginning, I think those are very overt most of the time now about disclosing their connection not just because they don't want to be accused later of misleading somebody, but I think because kind of like uh, the lost experience did at the time, they don't want people to fail to realize they're being marketed to, right? Like if you're going to spend money telling these extra stories and building these extra pieces for people to engage with, the last thing you want is to realize at the end that they had a good time with this stuff and didn't even realize that it was for lost or for your movie or for your TV show, because then from a marketing perspective, it's an absolute failure. And as long as a marketing department's paying for it, the thing that will matter most is not whether it was a good story, but whether it was effective as a marketing driver. Because a marketing team is not going to get a promotion or a raise or even a compliment if they enhance the story in a really wonderful way for the few hundred people who already were going to watch the story, but don't reach anybody who wasn't going to pay attention in the first place. That's interesting because I think to me as a you know as a fan who was sort of marginally involved with this at the time, the thing that, that stays with me from from the lost experience is you know less anything having to do with the the you know plot details that didn't turn out to matter that is mm-hmm. as you said you know maybe a hundred you know a couple hundred people cared about but more the whole thing and, and you talk about this in your essay of, of people working together and sharing knowledge and you know forming relationships totally. through it like the idea of collective yeah, intelligence just the idea yeah, that, that all of us together yeah can do collective things, none intelligence of us can do alone. That it brought everyone together in a way that you know sort of built you know, solidified the fandom. I, I thought that was, you know, the most, the coolest part of it. And I, I it just, I, I mean, I, I just wonder, I mean, is there, is there anything today that attempts to replicate that, even if it's, you know, different than, than what it was before? I think there are all kinds of things. I, I think that's still a grail that everybody chases after is how do you create and sustain that kind of community feel? Um, and I, you know, I don't have any empirical data to back this up. My guess would be that for a lot of people now, when they are nostalgic about Lost, it's not necessarily about the show itself, but it's about the experience they had with other people around the show. Oh, that's that's totally been my experience as well. That's what I have found yeah. interacting with other fans. What well. you miss is the purity of that community moment where you felt a sense of belonging with other people and you knew that this thing you all loved gave you something in common and a lot of friendships formed. You know, it's it's interesting. Like, I, I don't know that... I'm sure there are still some projects where... or some, you know, franchises, properties where ARG-like stuff or where storytelling serves a purpose and where it attracts a certain portion of the community. But I think if you look that same, the nostalgia for that kind of experience is now being created in other ways that aren't always about immersive kind of participatory fiction. For me, I can't, you know, I can't speak to the full scope of what's happening because one of the, one of the disappointments of moving out of academia and into the industry is you become more hyper aware of every decision you've been involved in and things that you've helped make happen but you have less time to pay attention to the entire field and know everything that's happening. And so you lose some of your perspective. Um, but for example, I mean, I, I, as I mentioned earlier, I did the, I was involved in the Kickstarter campaign for Veronica Mars. And then based on how that went as a case study, I ended up subsequently being tapped to run Kickstarter campaigns for reading rainbow. And then for a movie called super troopers two, which was a sequel to a cult classic and then for the revival of a TV series called Mystery Science Theater 3000. Um, and it's funny because the way I approached a lot of the work I did on that stuff was very similar to the way that I approached designing you know, an ARG back in the day when those were still a more popular thing, which was to understand that maybe less important than the individual things that happened were the ways in which we gave the community a chance to connect with each other. You know, it's being a fan isn't necessarily always about wanting to talk to the thing you're a fan of. It's wanting to talk to other people about the thing you're a fan of who are also fans. And so, you know, I think now, like one of the things I've loved about some of those experiences for Veronica Mars, for Mystery Science Theater 3000, are the people who I'm still in touch with, fans who, you know, got involved and felt like they were part of this movement to bring back this thing that they loved and that they, you know, 
actively strategize themselves and people work together. When we worked on Veronica Mars, my, one of my favorite moments in that experience was when the movie uh, improbably was included in a first round um, of an MTV competition for most anticipated movie of the year. And, you know, we didn't expect to win or even make it to like the third or fourth round because we were up against all the major franchises, Adventures, Hobbit, uh, you know, Hunger Games, all of it. Um, but we told the people who had supported the project, which was like 92, 93,000 people who had given money to the Veronica Mars movie, uh, that it could be helpful in people discovering the movie and understanding why so many people had cared enough to chip in some money for it. If we could make it to round two or round three, just so people would kind of be like, oh, wow, that's that's crazy. I've never even heard of that thing. And look how much the fans cared. And we then got messages from fans over this, the next few weeks, unsolicited, that they had gone as far as... We had fans who wrote computer programs that you could leave running on your computer that would cast a vote at every legally allowed interval. We had people who took day, vacation days from their jobs to stay home and organize phone banks to call other fans to you know vote as often as they could. Because it became their mission, not ours. You know, We didn't say, we want you to win this for us. But once they understood the stakes, they kind of decided as a community, this is something we can do. We can make this thing we care about uh, prominent and other people will understand why we care so much about it. So I do think what, what persists, even if it's not ARGs, is that I think there's a lot of value in understanding that fan communities bond when they have a shared mission they can work towards. Whether that mission is decipher why the Hanzo Foundation is on the island, or it's raise enough money for this you know show to come back and have another season, or it's help this charity that you know has values consistent to the things we love about our TV show gain the money they need to support five Make-A-Wish kids, whatever it is. Like, I think in some ways what matters now to fandom and what generates that kind of community and in turn that kind of nostalgia is just having some kind of shared mission that you actually believe you can be part of making a difference towards. So one of the last points Ivan makes here that I think is really on point is um, this idea that what we're so nostalgic for around Lost and, and other shows too is the experience, not necessarily the show itself as much as the experience we had around it, which is kind of all the mystery box stuff. Like what, what makes us miss these shows is the, the between week or the between episode weeks of asking the questions and talking to our friends and coworkers and wondering what happened. Um, and you recently wrote a piece about, I think exactly that, which is, um, touches on the, the growth in, rewatch podcasts. We are not the only people out here doing this, but um, Sammy wrote a piece about this for the LA Times uh, around Thanksgiving. Uh, yeah, you should go um, check that out. Search for LA Times, uh, The Hatch Podcast, Sammy Roth. Uh, actually, they, for, for those who don't know, that, that that's my, uh, my my day job is I, I write for the Times, <laughs> not about Lost, uh, about uh, energy and, and other things. But yeah, I, I did a piece for the calendar section. Um, if you live in LA, uh, pick up the uh, paper from... from last Sunday, December 1st, and, and yeah, you know, try to understand, um, you know, why is it that the TV rewatch podcasts are so popular right now, and also um, shared some some stories from behind the scenes of The Hatch that mm-hmm. if you enjoy our show, you um, <laughs> you may like to read, so uh, yeah. we'd Yeah, and former interview guests, um, Jason Mattel and um, Jonathan Gray also make an appearance in, in Sammy's piece, so that's fun. Uh, we will We will be back next week uh, watching D.O.C. It is a Sun episode and as Rosie said we will be uh, returning to the first of of several more segments uh, from Nestor Carbonell who plays uh, Richard Alpert which is a very very fun conversation. If you would like to hear your voice on the hatch you are more than welcome to call and leave us a hot take. We are at 9546 Dharma. Again that's 9546 Dharma. You can also send us a voice message on Facebook if you don't want to call the phone number. We're on Facebook at uh, facebook.com slash the hatch podcast also follow us on twitter if you use that platform we are at the hatch podcast if you like the show and would like to rate and review us on your podcast platform of choice that would be wonderful our cover art is by danny roth and our theme music is by andy g Cohn. see you next week namaste mm-hmm.